So this evening is the culmination of a great deal of work and I'll remind you that it was at the October 15, 2019 board meeting that you approved an agreement with Springfield Public Schools and Transpar, a consultant group that specializes in analyzing transportation services. And that was following a request for proposal process where we evaluated responses and identified the best firm to work with us on this work. And I'd like to invite Mr. Tim Ammon to the podium. Mr. Ammon, will be presenting the information for you this evening. He has been in transportation consultant work for 22 years and at least 20 of those with the Transpar Group. He has worked in over 400 school districts and that includes 40 countries. And important to note that the services that they provide are for very small school districts to very large school districts. And he shared with me that that's school districts that have 15 buses all the way to 1,500 buses. So uh, I will say that uh, I'd like to thank Jonathan Sheldon for the work that he and his team have done through this process because a number of us work together collaboratively, but especially he and his team to provide a plethora of data that was then analyzed by this team. And uh, Mr. Ammon will be presenting that information for you. Turn it over Very to good. you. Thank, thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it. Mr. Chair, members of the board, of the administration and the public, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present this evening the results of our transportation assessment. Uh, throughout the evening, we will be presenting a significant amount of quantitative information on the performance of the transportation department and on the opportunities that exist within transportation for different services that are, that are being presented right now and being provided right now. And what I will want to take you through is a, a set of criteria and a set of constraints that are necessary to enable those services and what we believe the outcome of that that service provision will be please uh, to interrupt you I just want to let you know that this board is active in its approach and may uh, interrupt from time to time with questions although we do want want to respect your time so uh, I'm just bracing you for this. <laughs> no, I, I have um, I prepared him. I have for been that. so informed. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I've been so informed. So please, please feel free um, through, throughout as we go. Um, and, and I think what is what is crucially important, honestly, is to, is to understand that beyond just the quantitative assessment of existing service was the underlying rationale for what our study was focused on, right? And when we think about that underlying rationale. What we see is that there were two primary purposes that we, that we came to this with the focus on. And that was, what is our opportunity to expand the provision of services to provide students access to more of the educational programs that you provide? It's clear, just being here tonight in the Honoring Excellence section, that the district is offering a huge number of services and, and maximizing opportunities to, to gain access to those as a worthy and laudable goal. And I think second to that, one of the things that we, were, we looked into is what are the additional opportunities to provide services to students who are currently not receiving them, um, and that is specifically in the realm of the magnet programs. And for us to be able to do that, ultimately it was necessary to do three things. The first thing was we had to establish a baseline. We had to look at the existing system and to gain a sense of where it was in terms of its efficiency and where it was in terms of its cost effectiveness um, because that would actually from an, from the outset provide us some insight into was there flexibility in the current system to be able to provide these services um, second to that we needed to in in this idea of how would we provide these this expansion beyond what is currently being offered um, what does that look like in terms of service requirements terms of the resources necessary for uh, that that are associated with drivers and buses and all of the rolling costs associated with that and then finally how do we merge those two assessments to identify what's the optimal way for us to be able to try to expand these services and offer maximum value while limiting the incremental cost of that to the greatest degree that we can and, and, and so th that became the focus of the effort and what you'll see, again, is as we transition to understanding the baseline, um, transportation is, is a service that I'm sure you're familiar is a wash in numbers and a wash in statistics. And so 
Uh, the next several slides will demonstrate that, if nothing else. Um, but but what, they, what they show us in our work is when we look at the critical criteria associated with, with what transportation departments are supposed to do, which is maximize the use of the assets that they, that they have been made available to them, um, it's clear that your organization has done an outstanding job of doing that. Um, your folks deserve a significant amount of credit for a very constrained environment and their efforts to provide efficient and cost-effective services. We see that primarily th through two statistics, um, one on this slide that I'll point out, which is um, when we look at the number of runs per bus. Um, so as you're probably familiar, and if you're not, we will get into in a little bit here, your system currently operates on a two-tier structure, so two runs in the morning, two runs in the afternoon. Um, so optimally, what we would like to see is every bus running around four runs a day. Your folks are actually higher than that. And they're higher than that because of some of the efficiency techniques that they've brought into the system. And that is a credit to them in the way that they are looking at solving what is a very difficult problem of a large geography and a constrained amount of time. Right? Because transportation is a time and distance problem, and right now we are constrained from a time perspective. Right? So we see that runs per bus as a critical indicator of the overall effectiveness of the system. When we look at um, on this slide, when we look at the use of capacity, which is essentially how are we using the seats that are available on the bus, we see those numbers uh, also are at the higher end of expectations in our business. And so again, demonstrating that the routing structures that have been put in place by the department are intended to maximize the use of the assets. It is those two things in combination high use of the assets and a high use of the available seating capacity that allows us to look at the cost of the system and to recognize that you're providing services cost effectively. Right? So we've broken down throughout, throughout the system for, into its component parts both on a, on a unit basis from a cost per student, cost per run, cost per bus perspective, but also through the different kinds of services that are provided including regular ed and special needs. And, and additional and other associated services. And what we see in all of those instances is indicators to us that the service is very cost effective. The ratio between regular ed and special needs services is lower than what we have seen in traditionally in similar sized districts and in some of the most efficient districts that we work in. Um, and I think in, in particular, when we look at the bottom statistic on the percent of the operating budget, um, that is a statistic in transportation that for some reason has held consistently over time in the most efficient operations at between four and six percent of operating costs and you're at three. So your folks are doing a lot of things to make the system cost effective and they deserve a significant amount of credit for that again in how they are managing this time and distance problem that they're working with. Right? Because when we look at transportation costs, one of the things that we see, and this isn't really that hard to understand, the predominance of the costs are in the people and in the assets, right? So everything that we do focuses on the degree to which we're maximizing their use to be efficient and effective, right? And so when we look at the proportion of that here, what we see is greater than 75% of the costs are in those two, those two elements, the people and the assets. So when we are looking at opportunities to expand services and when we are collaborating with your folks and talking about how to expand services, the things that we are focused on to address the second part of that question, which is how do we do that at a limited to minimal cost, is focus on opportunities to continue to use the people and the assets to the greatest degree possible. Right? So, so when, because what we see when we do this is we can look at the rolling cost, right? The rolling cost of the asset, which is essentially less depreciation. You know, we have the, the cost of fuel, the cost of maintenance, uh, the cost of actually putting someone in the seat, all of those various things. Um, we are able to use, you know, standard techniques to come up with what is effectively a cost per mile for the, for the way that your system functions. That cost per mile is consistent with the efficient organizations that we have seen of similar size and type and better than some who are in less constrained environments. But where this statistic is important to us is it allows us to use that value to get some understanding of were we to expand services, what is the likely impact on transportation allocation requirements and transportation expenditures, right? And so we will use that, that cost per mile statistic to make some of those estimates, okay? So again, 
that is the baseline of your current system. Your current system is performing efficiently and cost effectively. Um, that's terrific in every respect, except for its flexibility in offering new services. Right? And so we will get to how to try to address that within the structure of an inefficient and effective environment. This is the one instance, probably, where inefficiency would be a friend, and it's not. So we'll talk about how we try to address that as we go forward. When we think about looking at your organization relative to peers, um, I think it's important to recognize, uh, again, some of the challenges that your transportation organization is facing. Uh, so we worked with, with everybody in the district to, to reach out to a number of peer districts, both regionally and across the state. And one of the things that we see consistently, uh, both on this slide and on the next one, is that the operation that you are providing is more restrictive than all of your peers. It's more restrictive in terms of eligibility requirements. It's more restrictive in terms of the number of tiers in the system, which again, if transportation is a time and distance problem, the number of tiers is a critically important component of being able to drive additional efficiency into the system, which we will talk about a little bit further as we go. And what we do see is that in, in, in Springfield, um, we do have a high school start time that tends and trends towards the later end of the scale, so that's, that's certainly um, one of the things that we're trying to acknowledge and be cognizant of, um, given research from AAP and everybody else out there about high school times. So certainly we're aware of that and, and are trying to be cognizant of it in, in designing whatever future system we can come up with. Okay? So when we look at it again, uh, just from a regional perspective, um, one of the things that we see so, so here what I think is most striking is if we just look at enrollment, and we look at enrollment relative to tier, right? we have an enormously large district operating as if it's a small district. That creates a tremendous amount of logistical pressure. Right? And that's part of the rationale for why there is a significant number of techniques that are being used in the system to drive that efficiency and cost effectiveness in. So, so certainly for us, one of the considerations as we were going through this is any, of, any expansion of service is going to have to be aware of and highly attuned to what are the times within which we're getting kids to school. That's because again, while this isn't physically true, logistically what we're trying to do here is create time. So we are trying to drive time into the system in some way. The mechanisms that we use to do that is, again, if we start with your current bell structure, and I apologize for the font, it's a little bit difficult to read, but there's a fair number of things on there. Um, one of the things that, that, that we think everybody should be aware of here as the representation of your current bell schedule is that it does have this nominal two-tier structure represented by the green bars and the yellow bars, right? So just the groupings of those represents the tier structure. But I think what's important about that as well is both within the tier groupings and between the tier groupings, if we look at the horizontal length of the bars, Right? We have differences in instructional day, we have differences in transportation windows, we have differences in a variety of things that all, again, contribute to difficulties in terms of system design for transportation. So much of what your folks wrestle with on a daily basis and what we had to wrestle with from an analytical perspective is how do we try to make this system conform in some way and it will allow us to inject time into it to increase services. Right? So, so if we think about this as the baseline, um, what's important to recognize is, as I mentioned previously, there's not a tremendous amount of flexibility here. Right? And where, how do we know that? It's because when we apply this basic idea of saying, were we to reduce high school eligibility distances, and were we to add transportation to the magnet programs, what does that do to the current system? Right? How does that increase the requirements associated with transportation? And what we see in that instance is your current 132 bus system becomes something between 180 and 200 bus system. Right? So we're adding something in the neighborhood of 
roughly 50 to roughly 70 additional resources. Now, as you folks probably know better than I, uh, one of the things that's not raining out of the trees anywhere is school bus drivers. Right? So finding 50 to 70 additional ones feels like it might be a little bit of a challenge. Right? And, and in addition to that, I don't think planted next to the school bus driver tree is the money tree that rains out the 3.9 to 5.4 million additional dollars that we would need to do this if we were to change nothing else in the system. Right? So this is an important slide as a point of departure because it helps us understand how you, the efficiency of your existing system is constraining the ability to do additional things in it absent other structural changes. Well, but you didn't come here to ask us to drive buses, did you? I did not. And it's actually the same reason that I don't have a CDL. <laughs> Everywhere I'd go, they'd ask, and it's just much easier to say no. Clear that up before yeah, you well, no, it's just much easier to say. Although I think there's several people in the room who would be happy if you'd get them. Um, so, so I think what we, again, what we're trying to determine here is even in some sort of a Goldilocks scenario where we're finding a reasonable middle, right, we're still increasing the system by 58 buses. Right? So it's generally just not feasible to be able to do that. So we've got to look at how else we can change the structure of the system to try to be able to do that. Right? So what is that that we're trying to increase? Right? So what we're trying to do, and this is an illustrative example from one of each of the five high schools we, we conducted the same kind of analyses, where essentially we built out um, walk distances from each of the schools to try to assess how many students at each location we would be dealing with and what is the clustering of those students so that we could consider different kinds of routing techniques to be able to support them. Right? So for each of the five schools, we built this out. And one of the things that you can see is obviously the dots represent students and the building shockingly represents the school, right? Like, so it's a pretty simple graph to figure out here. Um, but but the, the, while this seems simple on its individual instances, when we aggregate it, it starts to become a really significant problem, right? Because when we aggregate it, what do we see? We see the addition of more than 3,000 total students. And if you remember the regional slide, it would make it the sixth largest, just these additional kids, would make it the sixth largest district in that region. Right? So this is a significant add to the system. It's a purposeful add, and, and, and so, but it, is a, it will be a challenge to be able to include these kids in. And one of the ways that, you know, again, we're uh, trying to figure out how do we assess recognizing, and I mean, anybody who shows up at high school or middle school knows that everybody doesn't ride every day. So how do we assess what the right number of students to estimate is so that we can provide some sort of reasonable understanding of what the increased demand would be? Um, we went through a couple of different analyses to figure that out. One was looking at just existing ridership level at the school. One was looking at middle school ridership level on the assumption that, that some of that will carry forward. One, some was looking at a blended middle school and high school ridership, looking at just the ninth and 10th grades. All of these various things to try to find the right midpoint or the right range for us to be able to think about where uh, the increase would come from. So when we look at what is effectively you know, sort of most constraining to least constraining, what we end up seeing is that somewhere between 31 and 51 runs, not buses in this instance, runs, would be necessary to pick these students up. And that's an important distinction when we get to start talking about bell times. Right? So what we see here is that there would be a need associated with these students. You know, again, if they were new to the system, that's where the 2.2 to, to $3.7 million estimate comes from if they're brand new. But if we can find a way to include them in the system as it exists right now by inserting time in some way, we can have a dramatic influence on what that total cost is. Okay? So, in addition to that, what we see is a similar kind of analysis at the magnet schools where um, we took students who were attending magnet schools and routed all of them as if we were designing bus routes for them in their current instance um, and estimated that we would need 23 runs to service them at current costs would be about a million seven. That's based on current students. Current students, current students. correct, yeah. Okay. And, and again, uh, some of this is 
um, confidence interval, right? Like we, we've got to have some sense of uh, th this is the only real point of departure that we have to be able to do it. Right. So when we do those two things and we aggregate the two of them, uh, this is again where that 3.9 to 5.4 million dollars in additional cost comes from, assuming we do nothing else to the system. Okay. So that's how we got to that point. Um, once, we, once we arrived at that point, it was necessary to start thinking about alternatives. <laughs> Thing? Yeah. I mean, you know, again, uh, it was made pretty clear to us that, that finding $5 million probably isn't going to be the easiest thing in the whole world, right? So, so how, do we, how do we think about this? Again, and, and we have two levers in transportation to pull, right? We have the time lever, and then we've got the use lever. And the use lever is pretty close to the bottom already, right? Because we are using the system really well. So we've got to think about the time lever. And, and so as a result, we went in and looked at, at opportunities around bell time schedules and how to revise bell schedules to, again, insert time into the system. Uh, our work was taken to, to take this system that of 25,000 enrolled students and move it from its comparison of small regional districts to a larger three-tier system that would be more consistent with larger districts and how they operate. Um, the three-tier structure that we came up with, um, there's some critical things to note about it. The first critical thing being, from our perspective, a minimum of 60 minutes is necessary between the tiers. Okay? Min between the tiers, between each of the individual school times. Um, we have identified 7.30, 8.30, and 9.30 as the times. That was primarily an analytical identification. If you chose to have it be 7.45, that would mean it would have to be 845 and 945. If you made it 7, that would make it 7, 8, and 9. As long as it's got 60 minutes in between, the routing structure works, whatever the baseline time. So it requires 60 minutes to make it work. Correct. It would require 60 minutes to make it work. Um, so what you'll see is in, these, in, in, the, exa in the two examples that we'll demonstrate here, um, which we believe are the two uh, uh, best, e best examples that we were able to derive, um, the first one, we start with uh, middle school students first and high school students second and elementary school <coughs> students last. Um, and in addition, we are inserting the expanded service for those roughly 3,000 additional students plus magnet school students. Um, and in doing so, what we are able to do by creating this three-tier system, which again gives us the opportunity, if you can sort of boil it down, to reuse the asset again to pick up more students. What that provides us with is the ability to do these services with approximately 100 and, well, with 119 maximum buses, which is actually fewer than we're using right now in total. Okay. And, but what we have here is we also have some increment, so I, I, I mentioned this $4 a mile um, cost earlier. We do have some incremental costs associated with providing these services because now that the buses are running again, they're aggregating more miles on them, so consequently we had to account for the time and the rolling costs associated with that. So we do see some costs associated with those. Um, and again, what you see in our best case to worst case here is um, cost increases that are somewhere between roughly 280000 and roughly $460,000. Um, and then when we add in the magnet school provision of services to that, um, that includes another approximately $570,000. That again? The number? Uh, 570,000. So it's uh, the bottom bullet. And, um, and so if you remember, our original estimates doing nothing was 3.9 million to 5.4 million. Um, here we are looking at somewhere around 800,000 to slightly over a million to be able to provide services to what is approximately uh, almost 50% more kids, 40-ish percent more kids. Okay? So uh, that's the first sample. Uh, the first model that we developed, which was again middle school first, high school second. Uh, the second model that we that we had was high school first, elementary second, middle last. Um, and again, this the the progress is similar. We assumed 7:30 again for just sake of the analysis, not because that's what that time has to be, but there does have to have to be 60 minutes between. Um, in this sense, a question. And maybe that you're going to tell me this isn't relevant, or you're going to get to it later. But if you, that, that seemed somewhat simple, unless you also add in the statement you made earlier that there aren't like tons of people sitting around wanting to be bus drivers, mm -hmm. and it occurs to me that you just increase the amount of time that they would spend doing that every day, and that might 
not be attractive to some people. Do it, am I missing something? Um, so uh, can we hold that for just a second? Yes. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, so, so what we see when we look at this example, right? Remember now that you're using 132 buses as, it, as currently exists. Right? There's 132 buses in the system right now. What we have under this scenario is again a maximum need of 129. So assuming we can fill to full complement, we've got the number of people that we require. Like eight people don't like it, we're okay. And it's probably, it's if there's four people that we can't recruit, not really that they don't like it, right? It's just the recruiting part is harder than keeping the liking part. Yeah. Um, and, and to your second question, I think arguably um, one of the things that we have seen is that when we extend service days, it actually helps retention because people make more money and it provides more consistency in schedule. Okay. Right? So that, that, that has a possible side benefit, not something that we looked at in the course of this study, but just as a result of the other work that we've done, that's what we've seen. Um, so again, what we see here is um, we see a need in the difference uh, of up to 129 assets. Right? And, and because of the way that we're structured and because it's fewer than the number of assets we're using now, the actual incremental cost of the individual runs doesn't change whether you put the high school first or the elementary school or the uh, middle school first. Um, so what we still continue to see is this roughly 800,000 to slightly more than a million dollar increase in, in allocation requirements. Um, and again, that is for the purpose of providing services to roughly 3,000 additional high school students and approximately 250 magnet school students. Okay, so when we look at it in summary, um, the first, well, the second column that you see is essentially our base case. Were we to do nothing and still want to provide these services, um, again, that cost range is, is approximately four to approximately 5.4 million. Um, were we to make changes to the bell schedule consistent with particularly that 60 minute tier criteria, um, those additional services can be, can be included in the system for, uh, in the neighborhood of 850,000 to, to $1 million. Um, and I, I would point out that administratively, um, this will be a notable effort for your staff. Uh, your staff, uh, we, we, will, we highlight in the report and we'll make a recommendation in the report um, that you, uh, you actually have a really lean transportation staff by any statistical measure whatsoever. Um, and so consequently, their ability to do this is going to, what, what's going to be necessary is to ensure that they have sufficient time and sufficient resources to be able to do it. Because uh, this is in no way a layup, right? But it is doable from a financial perspective, it's doable from an operational perspective, and it's doable from a technical perspective. So I think certainly with that, we'll take whatever other questions the board may have. Questions, comments? Okay. Well, I, one is I appreciate this. The second time we've been through this. Is that right? A few years ago. I don't know who else was on. I know Bruce and I went through it. Um, particularly with the bell change in start time. Uh, and as you can tell, we're going through the same thing. We're still doing it the same way. So that tells you a little bit about at the time. But that's not my question. Uh, the, the distance and the bell time, those are mutually exclusive, not a combination of both, right? Did I understand that right? It's either or? Um, I'm not or was it reducing the three and a half miles down? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, time? yeah, so so in order to, in, well, in order to not introduce the four to five and a half, or $5.4 million cost, it would be necessary to change the bell time to be able to enable those other changes. To, to do the reduced Correct. distance, yeah. okay. That's, that's what I want to make, I thought that's yeah. what it was, but I want to make sure that it wasn't either or. Um, the second one is you gave us a couple examples of 7.30, 8.30, and who starts when. Mm -hmm. I didn't see, and what research I've seen, high school students do better starting later. That was not one of the options. Is that, is that just something you just didn't show us, or no, uh, it was started one of, high school at 9.30 instead of yeah. 7.30? It was one of the analyses that, that we did do, and that, um, and from a cost perspective, was, was notably more costly than the others, but we ran into some other uh, operational concerns, too, around OTC and, oh, and scheduling yeah, and I, some of those kind of things as well. So, so uh, 
and I know Jonathan will shudder when I say this, but uh, in an effort to try to minimize the level of disruption, like we didn't want to introduce that as well. Um, but but you know it, it does it does present other uh, challenges from external partners. Oh, absolutely, where, where, yeah, yeah, where there may be a need to run sort of what would be characterized as kind of from a subsystem. Learning, from a learning standpoint. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and, and the last one is just a comment more than anything. I still have a real concern with a mile and a half for elementary kids. It has nothing to do with attendance, has nothing to do with anything but safety. I'm not, I don't want my kindergartner walking a mile and a half. Oh, I, I, I know that's not a part of this, you didn't look at that, I just, mm -hmm. but now I've got high schoolers walking the same distance as a middle, uh, kindergartner. That to me is disparity. So that's a comment and not, no criticism of the report because I know that's not your, what you're looking at. But at some point, I think that that concerns me greatly from the safety standpoint of our young kids. And I know that's cost. I understand that. So, and so that's, mm -hmm. I appreciate this. I, I really enjoyed reading through the mm -hmm. report and, and getting it. It's, concept makes a lot of sense. But any way we go is not going to be cheap. It can be cheaper, mm -hmm. but it ain't going to be cheap either way to go, even though it is the right thing to do. So I appreciate your the study you. and, and what you did. Mm -hmm. Other comments? Questions? You've given us an awful lot to think about. Thank you for your, for your work. Mm -hmm. uh, it, looks like, it looks like this will take further deliberation, maybe even further study. Uh, the most provocative statement was that statement about how a bill schedule change isn't something that just matters to the district as an organization, but it it impacts the uh, a lot in the community, mm -hmm. just like our school calendar uh, does. <laughs> Maybe you could be part of this. But this is something that we won't be deciding tonight, and we probably won't be deciding anytime soon. But we need this. This is a much needed study. Thank you, administration, for it. And uh, we appreciate uh, your work. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for the thank opportunity you. to collaborate with your folks. They, they were magnificent. I think that would be our uh, ask of you as board members is to, you saw the slide, short slide deck, you also have a full report that's a um, lot, a lot of pages with a lot, a lot of graphs and report or a lot of data diving very deep. So take your time, absorb that, send us questions, whether for further study or things that you want us to bring as we dive deeper. I think the realities is what we thought. It's possible to expand services and we're misaligned in our service structure as compared to peers, both regional and statewide, and we're also misaligned in our design of delivery right, as compared to statewide peers that are uh, more like us. So this will be an opportunity for us to study those things. Uh, we also have student attendance data that we've already pulled uh, that gives us some analysis of elementary, middle, and high and why, why we drove to high school as a start of change because that's where our biggest gaps exist between student yep. populations. Uh, and I think it's probably an indicator of some of the barriers that we've got in our system. So let us know what questions you have, and we will work to deliver those. Uh, for further clarification, months. both the presentation and the full report are posted for public consumption on board docs, if anyone's interested. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.